Lindsay Peterson, welcome to the ITA College Tennis Coaches Podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be on today and share a little bit about my story and my experience with volleyball and collegiate volleyball and see um, how that can benefit you. Great. You obviously, you're not a tennis coach or you aren't <laughs> a, a tennis player and, and we're kind of deviating from our, our usual show here, but I do know our coaches love to learn from other sports, especially folks that really understand the college space and um, have been immersed in it most of their life like you have. So you were obviously a, a, an outstanding player at Nebraska back in the early 2000s. You, you did coach uh, for a while after that, and we'll get into that in, in a minute. But just now in your role as director of ops uh, at the University of Nebraska for the volleyball women, women's volleyball team, um, how, how has the experience for student athletes changed since you started as a student athlete compared to uh, what student athletes experience today and and maybe some positives and potentially negatives to, to some of those changes? Yeah, I think back to when I was an athlete and I thought we were treated so well and we had the best of everything and my experience was incredible and I felt like, you know, we were it's really spoiled as athletes say, I mean, basically you had to try hard not to, to succeed as an athlete. I mean, all the resources provided to us as a student athlete from academics to just improving everything as an athlete, as an athlete, how to be the best overall person, best overall athlete from recovery, nutrition, strength and conditioning to academic support and resources made available to help you um, grow as a person. I thought we had it all. And then I, I look at what our athletes have today and it's a whole nother world. I mean, facilities have become so much better and so much more elite and the tech, the, the use of technology as a whole within athletics is really, I think, changed the landscape of it. And um, I mean, when we played if we wanted to go back and watch ourselves, it was something we did after practice. Now our players have the opportunity. It's a, five second delay and they get done with a rep and they, as they're standing off waiting to go again, they're seeing watching themselves and be able to get immediate feedback that way to make changes. And um, so I think of it those along those lines, I think it just the, the growth and the um, how the importance of recovery has, has really been stressed now as athletes. I think they're finally uh, they understanding the toll that being an elite athlete um, can take on a, you know, a 20 year old body. And in order to maintain that level, high level of performance, that recovery is a big deal. So just the amount of from cold tubs to massage therapy to all the latest, um, you know, light therapies and saunas and you name it that were not available that we didn't know anything about or even knew would benefit us back in the day, they have now. And, um, then I, I, I think of the major changes. I mean, I, I personally feel like it might be a, a negative. I'm sure if you ask somebody right now playing who didn't play back in the golden star, you know, the stone ages that they think I played in, um, I we didn't have social media. And I thought that was great. I, I thought, I mean, the way you communicated was person to person. There was no such thing. I mean, text messaging had just come in, but it wasn't like it is now. There's no Snapchat. There's no whatever else they use, TikTok and all that. And you weren't constantly feeling like you were under a microscope by the public. And every move you made was being scrutinized or criticized or um, somehow everyone felt like they had a say in your performance, maybe even your, you know, off the court what you did off the court. If they saw you, they comment about your outfit. I mean, I, that our athletes go through so much more mm. these days and are under such a, a microscope these days. And it, it's tough for them to understand. I mean, there's a lot of expectation already to come into a program, especially an elite program and try to perform day in and day out. And those expectations carry a lot of weight. Then you throw the expectations that social media causes and that, um, that, takes things to a whole nother level. Um, and so the, the things we've had to put in place just to help with that with sports psychologists and people working with team culture and people understanding, helping them understand the magnitude of what NIL has done now to college athletics. And, um, so 
yes, some of these things are great positives because I think they they did just bring your sport out and has made it more visible to so many more people and has almost put the athlete at a higher level um, out there as far as being recognized and um, given them a lot of opportunity, financial opportunities, opportunity for growth in their sport if they want a, a career moving on af after college athletics that wasn't available back when I played. But I also think it's complicated things in a way too, and has really changed the, just the landscape of college athletics and the idea of team and um, understanding the the importance of relationships and how you communicate person to person and not from a phone and how, how you can, um, you know, you don't have to change who you are to please the public. Like you're, you're good enough, your value in yourself and as a person is good enough. And, and we didn't have to worry about that back in the day. I mean, we, we had an identity outside of just a volleyball player. And I feel like now some of our athletes identity lies strictly in the sport that they're in due to what social media has done. Mm -hmm. But then in hindsight, social media has also given them a great platform um, to expand their brand, to give them opportunities with NIL that never existed. So it is kind of a double-edged sword, but my goodness, the changes from 2000, early 2000s to now have been, in my opinion, astronomical. And especially in these last five years, just to see where college athletics is going and um, almost to the point of it becoming like a professional sport. It has taken away a little bit of that um, innocence that college athletics used to have, I feel like. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, I think it all lies in the person you talk to, whether they see it as a positive or negative having seen so many of my athletes over the years, worked with so many athletes and seen the changes and stuff, I would definitely say that, yes, it has done great things for our sport. And it has really put college athletics, grown the business of college athletics. And, and, and especially in sports that in my time were just battling and starting to get media attention. And mm -hmm. now the media attention is record at a record level. So, yeah. um, that's a really long answer. And I don't know that I specifically answered it, but I, th I think there's so many areas that yeah. you can look at and try to dissect to see. And, and it might just even depend on the day and the athlete and the situation to decide if it's a positive or negative actually. Mm -hmm. And, but there have been several changes and I think we're, we're just going in that trajectory right now in college athletics. And I think there'll be more as we proceed for the next three to five years. Yeah, yeah, it sounds like we're we're going in that direction. You're speaking about recovery. I saw yesterday that a Big Twelve uh, athletic department are building a snow room for recovery. I don't even know what that is, but it sounds pretty cool. <laughs> I know, I know. We just we built a new facility here, and there is a whole wing dedicated to uh, recovery, and it's it's insane to see all the different. I mean, it is the floating tubs, the saltwater tubs that you can yeah. float in and do that. The um cryotherapy, you know, to do mm -hmm. that. It's just crazy, the different things, but yet mm -hmm. when you're looking at college athletics and what a business it is, and especially these athletes and now that what NIL has done and how much money some of these athletes are making, mm -hmm. the importance of that piece is, is really a game changer for some universities. Right. Right. And why, why do you think Lindsay, that story hasn't been told in recent decades. Like you said, you played in, in the early 2000s. I played similar timeline as well. We were both reporting that we had amazing experiences and, and that we weren't really wanting forever anything. We, we had what we thought we needed or mm -hmm. enough of what we needed to have a great experience. And over the decades, it seems like only the negative story has been told that, that um, these players aren't having a good experience. They're not being given what they needed. Um, why, why do you think that story hasn't been told and this, this other story has that has maybe brought us to this point where some student athletes are looking to become employees and, and maybe not fully understanding what the ramifications of, of that might mean for, for them, for their athletic department and for college sports as a whole? Well, I think that the, the good sometimes isn't interesting enough, you know, that doesn't, mm -hmm that doesn't sell the papers or the news space because everyone wants to hear, get the juicy details of what there's gotta be something going wrong. And so I think 
there's so many stories that are good and so many things that are positive in the direction we're going. And in some cases, sometimes it is, it's about trying to keep up with the Joneses almost, you know, well, this university did this. So we need to do that because this is how we're going to get the top athletes, which in hindsight, that's really not the case because all those material or resources you have in all reality can't really please the athlete if they're not getting right. what they think they deserve on the court or on the field or the attention they deserve or you know i just i think of all the comparison goes on it that goes on within the athletes and especially now with nil and, and how different there's so many different tiers of what athletes are getting and mm. i think they are more apt unhappy ones or more apt to go tell their story than the ones that have the same experience that you and I had that was great and thought we had everything we needed. Um, right. because what is there to tell besides it's great? Well, I mean, that's that's okay. They expected that, I guess, you know, that they, they expect to hear that from a power five university or whatever. And so um I really think that it's it's gonna be interesting because um you can you can do everything you can to get the athletes here, but as you continue to get the better athletes, there's still some people that thought they red carpet was laid out for them and they were going to have an automatic starting spot and it doesn't work out that way. And due to the transfer portal and the way it is now so easy for these student athletes to just, I'm not happy. I faced adversity. I'm jumping ship. That's, that's kind of the approach, the loyalty and commitment that existed back when we played. I mean, if you thought you were going to another school, you, you gave up a year of eligibility. You sat Yep. And that was a big penalty. And that made you really think about, is it really that bad? Am I really that bad off? Mm -hmm. And now the littlest thing can cause them to jump ship because of the availability and the options they have. There's no, there's no consequence. There's no um, responsibility held over their head for making the decision to go there and try and have to work through that. And so I think that's where the attention is right now in college athletics is, oh, why is this person leaving here to go here? There had to be something wrong happen. There had to be this. And sometimes there's not. I mean, we've had athletes that have left here that have had a great experience. They've left because the graduate transfer offers now, the extra yep. COVID year um, have caused it. But everyone assumes that it was for something bad or something that isn't made light of in the public that everyone wants to hear about. Right, right. Well, Lindsay, you know, talked about kind of volleyball, women's college volleyball being at, at the height of interest right now. What, what, again, what has changed over the last couple of decades that has really captured the imagination of, of not just the volleyball fan, but the, the, the general sports fan? Because the attendance numbers now, the 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 TV numbers for volleyball are just every year they seem to be <laughs> increasing yeah. exponentially. So so, what what has volleyball done to capture the imagination of so many? I don't think it's just volleyball. I I think I look at women's sports in general and mm -hmm. just the growth and how they're starting to close the gap with men's sports. Just you know, getting each year getting a little closer um, to the same type of recognition and media and visibility and everything. And it goes back to, I really think that social media plays a huge role in that because it allows people to actually feel like they truly know the athlete because mm -hmm. they followed their Instagram or their TikTok or whatever and know them beyond just the court. And they have, they feel like they have not a true relationship, but some sense of a relationship with that player because they followed them for so long and they know what their favorite makeup is to wear, what stores they shop at. And they're trying to, to, um, you know, copy that to hopefully have the same success as the athlete. And I, I think that has helped bring it to the forefront. I also believe that we've become creative in women's athletics to try to find ways to promote ourselves, whether it be piggyback off you know, doing a piggyback off of a successful men's program to try to gain more fans and attention um, or uh, just just having those really elite players that are doing things in their sport that 
just grab people's attention, like a Caitlin Clark, for example. I mean, she's selling out the Big Ten tournament that three years ago wasn't selling out. Well, they're selling out to see her and they maybe have never followed women's basketball because of that. So I think those little things and because of the, the media attention that is growing with it have made the biggest difference. Um, but I feel like we've, as, as, as a women's sports program, we've really had to try to push the envelope to find ways and we can't be okay with it staying how it was, or, you know, just being okay with getting one or two matches on TV. I feel like there's a lot of people in significant roles out there that are fighting for the sport and fighting for this growth in all of, of women's sports. And then once that opportunity is provided and they're, you know, they're willing to take this risk to invest in it a little bit and see where it goes um, they've seen the reward from it. And I think uh, we're, we're grabbing the attention of fans that normally wouldn't one don't have the opportunity to attend the game, wouldn't normally watch and see that the passion, the um, competitiveness, the athleticism, all that is still very much real in female sports, but we also, the sports also still carry that feminine type personality and feel that it's not the men's game, you know? So I think that sometimes captivates a different audience in itself. Um, but I would, I would really attribute the growth of social media to a lot of it um, just because the athletes have done a good job marketing themselves out there and they've found ways to, you know, if, if a eight-year-old little girl comes to mom and dad and says, Hey, I saw this, I, this girl's, you know, I watched this girl on Instagram or TikTok. I really want to, and they see like, Oh yeah, this could be something positive. Let's take our daughter to watch it. And it just kind of springboards from there. Mm -hmm. I think that that has played a big role. And, and so is that something that again is specific to women's volleyball um, culture in, in terms of players at maybe an earlier age, recognizing that they need to build up their social media following to maybe get attention from, from mm -hmm. college coaches. And then from there, they recognize now, I guess, NIL opportunities. But but what is it about the volleyball and these players? Or, or was it something that coaches are telling these players, look, if, if we want to fill out, out our, our, our stands for our home matches, you guys need to be more active on, on social media. I guess, where is that influence coming from and, and maybe why? Well, I think some of it is just, yeah, the them growing up and seeing who is their role model, who are they following, who are they paying attention to, mm -hmm. and now they're in a position to do the same thing. And so... Um, NIL has kind of motivated them to get themselves out there on social media. Um, we have the benefit volleyball is the fastest growing, um, female sport right now. And mm -hmm. if I were to say, this is what caused it, I, I don't know that I know what really yeah. caused that besides, um, I know that the getting matches on TV has helped, but I also know just the availability for young girls to start in that sport has become more, the opportunities are greater than they used to be 20 years ago. I mean, when I was in high school, we had two club teams you could play for in Lincoln. And now I, I want to say there's eight or nine major clubs here in Lincoln and every small town has a club now. And right. so it's just more available because, and so it gives those, those girls op opportunity to get into that um from our personal standpoint no we're not telling our players to go out and put stuff on social media um but the demand is there we're getting it from our fans and we're in a little bit of a unique situation in nebraska just because our fans are incredible i mean we have a fan base probably unlike any other just because we don't have a professional sport that we're battling with to get fans all eyes are on the university of nebraska and their sports team so um our program really our coach you know back in the 90s 80s used the um the success and the tradition of football to try to build the fan base for volleyball and scheduling games after football games and allowing football fans to come and get into a game for, if you show your football ticket, you get in free. Mm -hmm. Well, that slowly caught on and caught fire and more and more people. And then all of a sudden 
you had to have season tickets to get in. And then we're moving to a different venue that's twice the size and we still have a waiting list. And, and when we go on the road, we're selling out other places just because of one coach taking a risk to say, Hey, we're going to try this. We're going to use the success of men's of our football team. And hopefully we can really get into why they followed Nebraska football so well, and now get them to also follow Nebraska volleyball as well. Mm -hmm. And, um, so we, we are in a unique situation there. So our fan base craves the, you know, the posts and the, anything they can get from our athletes because they just really follow them and they feel like that they're connected that way. Mm -hmm. Um, but I don't, I know it's not like that everywhere. I just think getting if, especially for female sports, getting the young girls somehow into it and finding a role model in some sport tennis golf softball whatever it is mm -hmm. that just helps because if she wants to go usually four or five other people are going to go from the family to get her to that game and i think that's that's truly what happened for us to grow volleyball here is a little girl came from a football game and hey dad i want to go look at this and the whole family goes in and then next time you know a couple more families come in and it just kind of continues to grow from there mm -hmm. and i'm i guess trying to figure out as well i mean what what influence are our, our coaches can have on on the popularity of the sport and again every sport's different there's so many factors like so with tennis we are competing with this pro game that is yeah. is, is global and and you know superstar billionaire athletes etc that that may be um, young players are more likely to follow them than, yeah. than college players. And, and and maybe that's starting to shift a little bit as we, we we're starting to have more players come through the college system and have success on the pros. So that's, that's hopefully going to positively influence that. And in speaking with Kathy DeBoer several years ago, who's the former uh, executive director of the ABCA, uh, which is, I guess, the, the equivalent of the ITA for yeah. tennis, um, you know, she talked about the the changes in the scoring, the rally scoring, and I think there was a lot of reluctance on behalf of the coaches uh, to make that switch at, at that time. And and it sounds like it was relatively unpopular, but I think it was maybe changed by the Olympic um, uh, level mm -hmm. and other governing bodies. So I think college volleyball was maybe a little late to the game, but once they made that change, that had an influence maybe on on it the viewership of it. I guess where I'm leading with this, this question, Lindsay, is how much did coaches influence the current popularity of, of volleyball? Or, or was it just all these ingredients came together at the right time with the right people, like you said, fighting for women's sports and, and maybe gravitating like, oh, volleyball might be one of these sports that we can really put on a pedestal here and see where it goes or, or any thoughts you have on that? Yeah. Um, I, I agree. I think that being willing to make some changes to, to shift our game more like the na international game played a big role in mm -hmm. allowing our, our sport to get on TV, but that did take a lot of push from coaches too. I mean, there were coaches that weren't supportive of it, but there were a lot of coaches supportive of it because they knew they had talked to Pete, different TV, you know, outlets. And that's what's saying volleyball is too long. They don't know when side out right. games, it could go three hours. It could go an hour. You don't know. This definitely gave them a better a time window, you know, window of time that they thought they could put it in. And that was huge. And that, that gave I, the outlets a little bit more of a reason to want to support it. And um, we're seeing the same, we're still seeing it with the challenges. Sometimes a challenge in our game could take forever right and to tennis it's a quick you know with the the in out that's on the computer that system well our we don't have a professional volleyball per uh that we're battling with here in the states it's just starting to actually this is an inaugural year and we have one here in omaha but we'll have two leagues that are going to be here in the united states to hopefully keep some of our talent in the you know mainland rather than leaving and going to right. other countries to play um so yeah we aren't battling that professional versus collegiate athlete because really the professional volleyball player is not visible to our our mm -hmm. young fan base or our, you know our young athletes it's just not it's not on tv you don't watch it you have to stream it via computer and it's not not out there 
as much as college sports is. And that I would say our coaches and they continue to, I mean, coach cook is on the rules committee and they're constantly looking at rules to try to change it, to make it more pleasing to viewership. And mm. one of those is we got to look at changing our um, system, our challenge system to go to what the they're doing in the Olympics and doing internationally and doing what tennis does to make it's a quick call. It's like that. It's not a five minute delay where you, people wondering what's going on. And if they don't understand the game, they really don't know what's going on. And then you lose viewers. So mm-hmm. um, there's, there's coaches pushing to that. There's coaches pushing to change different rules that right now are just based off of the um, basically the interpretation of the referee, you know, it's, it's a, their own call and what they perceived happened instead of a, flatline like okay we are we aren't going to call this you know if if the ball spins who cares we're not going to call it or if the ball spins it's called no matter who touches the ball you know things like that to make it a hard line rule that's easier to follow rather than like well why did they call this play this time and they didn't call it that time mm-hmm. so i think it is on the coaches to help educate a little bit the fans or make it so it's an easy thing to watch and pick up on because as a viewer i don't want to sit and watch a sport that i have I don't understand why they got a point, how the team wins, any of the, not necessarily knowing the strategy behind it, but you can kind of with understanding the sport, understand the main point of it to try to be successful. And if you question that, it's really hard to watch it because you, it'd be like me watching a foreign language, you know, a movie in a foreign language, I'd have no idea what's going on. And so that we have in our sport had a ton of push from our coaches trying to make those changes to make it more pleasing to the viewer, to help captivate new viewers into it. So if you were flipping through channels and saw it, maybe after the second or third time watching it, you'd have a pretty good idea what's going on. You wouldn't have to go look it up in Google search to try to understand the rules of the game. Yeah. Yeah. And and do you know, I mean, because again, our coaches have, have a lot of the same conversations and and some of the coaches will, will push back and, and, say, well, look, I'm never going to be on television, my program, why, why would, why would we change our sport or um, make this rule change where it's really not going to impact me? I mean, what, what do you know how some of those conversations went with the volleyball coaches and how they maybe assuaded some of those coaches that were, had, had a level of reluctance to, to make those changes? Yeah. um, We, we, there obviously there is that conversation. I think that it was just those coaches that finally said, look, are we coaching because of the good of the sport or are we coaching for personal, you know, recognition or, or personal reward? And I think if you would have asked coach Pettit back in the 1980s, if he ever would have thought because he pushed to try to get our public TV to televise a game. I mean, we had boosters out fundraise fundraising to put the money, give the money to our public television station mm-hmm to televise a game so the people in Western Nebraska could watch it and then understand. And they became fans, you know? So Mm. when he did that, I don't think he would have ever anticipated 30, 40 years later, we were selling, setting a world record and having 92,000 people in a football stadium to watch a volleyball match, but he didn't do it for that reason. He did it because he felt passionate about the sport and he was trying to grow the opportunities for the young females. And so I think it was those coaches that really kind of put their neck out there a little bit and, you know, got people to believe that if we don't step out for our sport, who's going to, and yeah, it may not be immediate and it may not happen even in our lifetime, but we're here to make an impact and make a change. And so that's why we're in this position. And so using their position of leadership to try to make that change. And I think there was enough coaches pushing for that and trying to preach that same message that it helped get more on board. Like, right. Why really look at, truly look at themselves. Why and answer, why am I a coach? What is my why for coaching? Is it all personal or is it for the sport and for the athletes? And what am I trying to accomplish here? And that really spearheaded a few more of those conversations and mm-hmm. push to get, you know, make some changes and, and you can, you can think outside the box. I mean, you can always be told no, but if you don't ask or don't try, how do you know? And so I think that was just the approach they went like, 
So what's it going to do? We're going to get told no. It's not going to change where we're at right now if we get told no. Yeah. And and one of the other things that Kathy mentioned to us was around um, just attendance at games. She she used to preach to the coaches that look, we're we're going to have a hard time getting on television unless there's people in the stands. It, it doesn't mm -hmm. look like a great product to ESPN and these other networks if there's lots of open seats and and you know you talk about okay we're gonna cram everybody where whatever the camera yeah. is make sure everybody sits in that area but um you, you know again what what steps do, have you seen coaches take over the decades at, at all different programs not mm -hmm. not just at the very top that have maybe helped that attendance and that has moved it along again to, to this point are there any Anything you think our, our coaches might consider if they're looking to increase their attendance at their home games? Yeah, I mean, a big thing that we talked about here is you have to make it a positive experience. So no matter what the product is out on the court or the mm -hmm. field, that when the fans walk away, they feel like it was a positive experience. They've created a memory and they'd want to do it again. And so we've really we really looked at things that we could do I mean, simple things of making sure there's enough restrooms available. You know, if it's a women's sport and you think you're going to attract more women, make sure there's more women's restrooms available than men. You know, make sure that if you can make parking easier, simplify the parking process, how to make um, when there is downtime during the event, there's some type of stimulation going on, whether it's a game or somebody's playing a, you know, a marketing game, or there's a video on a video board, or there's some type of music message playing, or you have a athlete answering questions as quick as they can, whatever it is to try to still keep those people captivated and, um, you know, or giveaways. I mean, you have to understand, like we started, it was just about getting people in the seats. So it wasn't about trying to make money. And that has to be a, a risk and something that, I guess administration and the higher ups have to be on board with that. We're not trying to make every penny we can here. We're trying to get people in and then down the road, we can hopefully make them yeah. make money. And so inviting, you know, one night is high school night, one night is club, you know, club night or giveaways, you know, the first thousand people get this and we made our athletes available to sign autographs and meet and greets and, um, you know, our athletes threw out balls, signed balls, or they threw out gum back in the day. You're something that just grabbed the attention of the fans. And like I said, they may not know who won or lost when they left. Obviously winning helps, but our approach was if you're not winning, you still have to find a way for them to say that was worth my time. And if it was money, my money to be there. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's more of a, experience it than it is just coming sit in the seat and watching what's the game itself right and can you share a little bit you mentioned the the world record uh breaking that that attendance record at a, a women's sporting event so can you talk about how that came about and then why you guys at nebraska were confident that you could at least getting close never mind <laughs> making it happen but there'd be nothing worse than you know building out that stadium and maybe only 20,000 people, yeah, right. which is still a crazy number, but how, how tell us a little bit about that. Cause that's just incredible. So um, we had held all the previous records for volleyball matches, attendance records. And then the year before Wisconsin played in their basketball arena and sold it out and beat our record. Well, we have no arenas here in Nebraska that we could play in that would beat that record. And that was, we just didn't have that capability. Mm -hmm. So coach was joking one day and just said, well, fine, let's just play in the football stadium so we can break the record. <laughs> and it was a joke to start, but then more and more people started talking and thinking about it. And they're like, yeah, we should do this. And so originally we thought, well, we're going to need to do something of thinking about the experience to encourage fans to come to make it worth them coming. So we talked about hosting a concert in conjunction following the, the tournament. So a couple of years previous, before that, we'd held a big um, uh, Garth Brooks concert, packed the stadium. I mean, it was a big, big event. And so trying to think about how we, you know, how can we do that, bring in a name man 
you know, big name band or something to fill the stadium, maybe more for the concert than the game. But we started looking into that and um, it had to be, basically it was, everyone had to be in their seats by the second game logged in. And that was the attendance record that was put in. And well, when we talked about putting tickets on sale, we originally thought we would get maybe 30 to 40,000 people. So we only opened a certain portion of the stadium, how we had the court configured. We thought this would look pretty full. This would be a good. And within the first hour we had sold, I mean, our computer system had gone out. It was total chaos and we had sold more than 30,000 tickets. Wow. And so we just continued to open up more and more sections Mm. And there was one part of this section we weren't going to open at all because we were going to put the stage down there on the field and thought that would probably be an obstructed view ticket and whatever. And um, we ended up opening that up and selling that out. And uh, we had a press conference promoting it. It helped to say that we were we were recognizing not just Nebraska volleyball, but volleyball in the state. Our high school teams are you know, playing at very high levels. We have a lot of recruits coming out of high school from Nebraska. We have several successful NAIA Division II programs in Nebraska, so recognizing them. Um, so we made it more about the state, not just about our program. Yeah. And that really got a bunch of, you know, our fans on board. Like, they bought into that. And and it helped because so many fans have never had the opportunity to see us play because our arena only holds 8,000, and it's hard to get a ticket. And so... Yeah there were a lot of people that wanted to watch us play. And um, we, we ended up selling more tickets before we even had an act contracted or signed that the, and we checked with NCA and they said, well, your ticket sales were not based off your concert because you hadn't even named a singer. Nobody even knew if the concert was going to go. So mm -hmm. they said, based off your ticket sales, whatever you sold before you have a contract with the singer, that will be your record. You know, that's what we'll go off of. Well, we'd sold the stadium out before even announcing who our artists would be for the, mm -hmm. and so we realized they weren't really coming for the music. They were really coming to be part of this event and to see, to see the volleyball. And um, yeah, there was a whole bunch going in. I mean, it could have been a big flop if the weather wouldn't have worked. I mean, yeah. really all the stars aligned for it to be a success. Um, it was a huge, huge planning event on everybody's part in this department and, um, but it was also a huge risk. Like we said, it was a huge risk. And I think looking back to how we built our fan base to even consider doing something like this, people that came before took a huge risk in how they marketed the program, how they tried to, you know, they set the chairs up to get the players set the chairs to have fans to come watch. Like that's things they were doing like that years and years ago, taking those risks. So Today, we could take that risk to try to, you know, do something at that magnitude. And so it really, it really was an accumulation of what um, the tradition of our program over all the years to get to that point. It definitely mm -hmm. didn't happen overnight. It wasn't just a, hey, let's try this and see if it works. We had a lot of things in place understanding we had the support of our team. We knew Nebraska fans were loyal. We knew if we challenged them to try to be a record and do a world record, they'd step up to the plate. Um, so we had those in our favor to help do it, but it was still a huge undertaking and it was still, it was a still a risk. And like I said, everyone's like, so are you going to do it again this year? And I was like, absolutely not. Like, mm -hmm. I feel like all of our luck ran out on that one event and we're not going to get greedy. We're yeah. going to be just fine. <laughs> yeah. No, what an incredible story and congratulations. That's uh, what, what an achievement and something yeah. you guys will remember for, for the rest of your lives and, and probably many generations of right. volleyball players in in uh, in the state of Nebraska. Um, well, just along those lines, and, and last question, Lindsay. Just uh, you, you know, you talk about this infrastructure that's now in place. Like probably may, and, and I might be assuming something here, but the position you're in now may not existed in the '90s or when you played. No, right. I didn't. Right. The right. first so, director of ops was when I was a sophomore. Yeah. Yeah. So so now a lot of programs have uh, the top programs ha have an infrastructure where they're able to take these responsibilities away from the coach but as you said there's previous generations that the coach took on a huge amount of responsibility in terms of marketing their program trying to get people out 
like you talked about the coach um trying to get get the 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 program or matches home matches on on local tv and that took away uh from their ability maybe to coach as much as they would yeah. like but they recognize the importance of doing that and and so again is there any message you would leave with our coaches as to how they might proportion their time if they don't have a lot around them how might they think about managing their year managing their priorities figuring out how to make the marketing side of their tennis program a higher priority and, and maybe what are some of the benefits of doing that well i think that's definitely the give or take here is yeah you know as coaches the mindset and the way coaches think is we got to train we got to develop the athletes we got to get better and they don't think of all the outside stuff um I would encourage, even if there's not a full-time position, is to use your resources at your school. I'm, I mean, our this younger generation is so creative, so crafty when it comes to social media marketing, and they're always looking for something just to get on the resume. And so I know that in the past we've used other college kids like, hey, um, would you want to do an internship with our program and you're in charge of our marketing, help us create ideas, help us think of how we can market our sport. How can we put more stuff on social media? Do you, yeah. If you, if they come to you and say, Hey, I want to do, you know, a game between two players on social media, a quick video to post, you know, you have to, it may seem silly and it may take some time that you think is a waste, but you'd have to support that because of the gains you're going to get just by getting your athletes out there and allowing that connection with the fans. And um, I think that you have to sit down and really write your priorities. What do you want to do with your program in five years? Is your goal to have more people in the stands? Is your goal for tennis to be televised more? Do you want to have more resources available to your program? Whatever it is, and figure out what your goal is for five years and really start putting your priorities and weighing how much you're putting towards that versus just being a coach. And I say just being a coach, there's a lot these days that goes into just being sure. a coach because you have to manage so many different things. You're really a manager, not a coach. The good old days of just coaching the sport are gone. I mean, you're you're managing so much. So um, trying to tap into not those, I'm not, when I say free, I just think there's people around that are constantly looking at ways they want to be involved in sports somehow. Mm -hmm. Maybe they play tennis in high school, can't play in college, but it's a way for them to still be a part of the program. We have found players that have played volleyball in, in high school. They've just come to college here. They can't, they don't want to, um, they can't play at this level or aren't at this level, but they still want to be involved. So we find ways to get them involved. And that may be, you're going to be here at, are we're going to do a fan day and you're going to be here to help get everything set up. And for doing that, you're going to get, you know, we'll get, make sure you have tickets to the game or, you know, just little rewards like that. That's nothing huge, but they feel a part and it benefits your program and they get something from it too. And so that would be my biggest advice because it takes, if you're not one of those premier sports, it's just college sports right now. The resources don't get all the way allocated fairly and they're not, you know, football in our, in our, you know, our university is the giant, you know, it runs everything. And without them, we wouldn't have our budget. We wouldn't have the opportunities we have. So it's understandable that we don't get what they get. So you have to sometimes see what the other sports are doing that maybe you're not getting and find a way to be creative that you can do the same thing or, piggyback off or do something in conjunction. I mean, we've done stuff with other sports where, um, you know, our spring match, when we did a spring match, it was in conjunction right after that, there was a softball game. So we promoted from our spring match to get people to go watch the softball game. And it was, if you went over there just to tie things together, try to support other women's sports or another support sport. And so um, finding ways to do that, to help your program grow but it also has to be, like you said, it has to, you have to figure out what your priority and what your goal is and, and really sitting down and thinking about and finding where do I want our program to be in five years and how, are, what are the steps I have to do to, to do this? And yeah, you might have to sacrifice a little more time from training to gain that, 
but the visibility and the um, growth of your program will come back and help you in what you lacked in training by mm -hmm. getting maybe a better recruit or, you know, just when, when athletes want to come play in front of people, like they don't want to play in an empty stadium. Right. So that alone is a, could be a, a selling point for you. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, I just think it's, our coach cook, I think has done a really great job. He's surrounded himself with great people to accomplish what he's not great at and what his weaknesses are. And so he finds he's great trainer mastermind at that. He can relate to people and do that, but he's not going to be about the foo-foo stuff. He said, you know, all those other little things. So I have to really sit down and like, listen, I know you're not going to want to do this. I know you're going to think it's a waste of time, but we need to have this fan day. I need you to be able to take pictures with fans. You got to do this. And it's two hours of your time and it's going to benefit our team this whole season if we do this. Yeah. So yeah. that would be my advice. And I know it's easier said than done. <laughs> Absolutely. But no, I think it's, it's great advice. And, and Lindsay, I really appreciate you sharing your perspectives, your experiences and, and advice with our coaches. It's, it's always great to learn what other sports are doing. So um, yeah, thank you again for making time for this and making time for college tennis. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate you having me on and um, taking the time to listen. And I, I, I think just in sports in general, supporting other sports is key and not becoming a silo. And, and so I think that's important. And, and those that are willing to learn from other sports and open to that uh, it speaks volumes because if it's, you find trouble when you think you know it all, or, you know, you've got it figured out for your sport. And, and I think there's just so many different great ideas within each program that benefit can really benefit other programs. Couldn't agree more. Thank you, Lindsay. Yep. Take care.